Good morning, Fellowship Fable. How are we? Hmm. It's a beautiful day outside. The Razorbacks clinched over the weekend. Are we good? All right. Are y'all with me here? Uh, my name's Garland. I am one of the pastors here, and it's great to be with y'all this morning. A little interaction here right off the bat. Uh, if you, somebody just show of hands here, if you have ever run a marathon or even thought about running a marathon, raise your hand. We can see you. If you've run a marathon, thought about running a marathon, raise it high so we can all see. Look around, everybody. Okay, he's a handful of people in the room. Right, here, here's my question for you. Why? Like, why? Like, what's wrong with you? I don't understand why these people are smiling in this marathon. Um, so I've had several friends of mine who have uh, run marathons, and uh, they all say something similar about the marathon. They all say that somewhere around mile like 18 or 22, and one, those of you that have run a marathon, you can tell me, I've never even thought about running a marathon. It sounds miserable uh, to me. It's not anything I would ever want to do, nothing in my wildest imagination made me want to run 26 Point two, running point two miles is about as far as I want to go, not 26.2 miles. Um, but my friends that have run them have told me that somewhere around mile 18 to 22, somewhere in there, is when the, like, the body just says, I'm done. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. The pain begins to set in, uh, the cramps, like it gets really, really difficult. And you've got to press through in that moment. And my question for you marathon runners is, what is it that pushes you through that moment? Like, that's when I would just quit. Like I'd be done, I can't imagine what's on the other side of those next six, eight, 10 miles that's worth it. Like when you go through some pains in life, you can see through to the other side. Like think about braces. If you had braces, raise your hand. All right, a lot of us braces people in the room. Okay, if you, uh, if you remember back to braces, they hurt, right? Especially with those rubber bands on, they hurt. But you can see through to the other side, you're gonna have brilliant, perfect teeth on the other side of this. Labor and delivery. It's a painful process for those of you that have been through it, but you can see through the other side and you've got this, this kid you've been carrying for nine months and here they are. But I can't in my right mind fathom what is on the other side of those last eight to 10 miles except where it's over. Like the thing is finally over. But if you think about it, when the moment of pain, when the moment of difficulty hits, mile 18, what pushes you through? And if you think about it, this actually becomes one of the most important questions about life, is what pushes you through those moments of fear and discouragement and pain? Like it's a really significant question for your life and for my life, because it's coming. Like the mile 18 of life is coming for literally every single one of us in here. And for this little church, that, it, that this letter was written to nearly 2,000 years ago, they're experiencing pain. And this morning, we're gonna look at how do we get poise, grit, toughness for those painful moments in life. Now, the pain that this church is experiencing these 2000, nearly 2,000 years ago, for them, it's physical pain, persecution. They're actually facing persecution for their pledge that Jesus is the true king. They're experiencing social pressure around them from family, from friends, from their community saying, your belief in Jesus is costing you. They've lost power. And, and for many, they're even staring down death itself. That's the pain that they're experiencing. And it's to that situation that this letter to the Hebrews has been delivered. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to, try to discover how we get poised in the pain by looking at Hebrews chapter two. Here's our three points for you note takers, which should be all of you note takers in the room. Here's our, here's our outline. We're gonna work our way through the passage this morning. We're gonna see that Jesus meets us in our pain, he leads us through our pain, and he calls us beyond our pain. How do we get poised in the pain? We have to see Jesus who meets us in it, leads us through it, and calls us beyond it. Now, time out, quick time out. I recognize that for some of you in the room this morning, you came in here and you're in it right now. Like, there's circumstances of your life, and you're in the pain right now. And it was hard maybe to come in here this morning. Maybe you came in here going, I'm just desperate for something. Maybe it's a financial insecurity job loss or a diagnosis that you weren't expecting or somebody in your family wasn't expecting. 
Maybe it's like the, the church this letter was written to. You're feeling the social pressure of walking around in a, in a world and saying, we think Jesus is our king in a culture that's hostile to that claim. Maybe it's the loss of somebody close to you. You're staring, down, I mean, you're, you're staring death in the face with somebody close to you, maybe for you yourself. You're in it as you came in here. You're in the midst of that pain. My prayer, my hope be that this morning might, might give you a little bit of poison that just a little bit more confidence in the Lord. And maybe it's for the rest of you. You come in here this morning and, and things are going really well in your life. And right now things are good. I'm sorry to say it, but it's coming for you and, and for me. And what you do when it hits is really important. And, and what we're going to see is this contrast. This is a radical claim that Hebrews is going to make about who our God is and how he meets us in the pain. It's not like any other ideology, any other religious system, any other spiritual claim, not anything like this. And just to draw that contrast out, I wanna take you back to the ancient Greek culture. In the ancient Greek culture, there was one particular religious brand, it's a philosophical brand, it passed down to us now as this thing we call Platonism. Here's the Platonic view of God. Their conception of God is this. God exists, if he exists at all, well beyond this physical, tangible world that we find ourselves in. We exist here in the physical, tangible, and God exists out in the world of the forms. We, we see the shadows on the wall, but God exists in reality. But it's way distant. He's perfect. He's holy. He's unassailable. He's unattainable, if he exists at all. He's a being that would never, ever stoop down to this nasty, physical, tangible world. So what do you do as a Platonist when the pain hits? God is a million miles away. And by the way, for many, maybe many of you in the room right now, that's your conception of the God of the Bible. We're gonna see it's not right. But for maybe many of us in the room, when you go through pain and fear and anxiety in your life, God feels like he's a million miles away. And what we're gonna see is that's not the God of the scripture. Uh, in, in the Roman culture, this is descended down from the Greek culture. This is the worst photo I could find of this on Google, so I put it on here because it's just funny to me. Um, the internet's funny. Um, so in the Roman pantheon of gods, the gods were much more attainable. I mean, they're nearer. We kind of know things about them, but the problem with them is they're aloof. They're up on Mount Olympus, they're living the high life, they don't care about your life and your pain. Yeah, we try to appease them, we try to make them happy that they might bless us, but when you go through it, when you find yourself in the midst of it, when you gotta dig deep, they don't care about your individual personal pain. And maybe, by the way, maybe that's how some of you feel about the God of the Bible this morning. Maybe he's not a million miles away. Maybe you do think he's, he's there, he exists and all that. But he doesn't really care. He doesn't seem to love you. He's left you in it. Now, those are some, those are, we, we're not gonna go through every single religious claim, obviously. Those are some of the ancient ones. I wanna, I wanna also compare this with maybe the dominant uh, worldview that we find ourselves in, in in the Western culture. I'm gonna call it the, the secular naturalistic worldview. Okay, and by naturalistic, I mean this. It's the claim that there are, only a, there are only naturalistic explanations for things in this world. No supernatural explanation is allowed. It's a naturalistic assumption about our world. And by secular, I mean we don't need God in the equation. You tracking with me? It's the dominant worldview that we find ourselves in in our culture, particularly in academia, all right? Now, in this secular, naturalistic worldview that we find ourselves in in the Western culture, where there is no God in the equation, and we're a product of cause and effect over a long, long, long time. What do you do in your pain in that worldview? Now, I, I recognize that there may be somebody in this room, and you've come in here this morning, and that's the worldview you've adopted. Or maybe you're considering it. You're going, I don't know about this whole God thing, and I think this, this makes more sense of life. Can I, can I just challenge you just for a moment? May I challenge you to take your worldview all the way down to its bottom, all the way down to its foundation. To do that, I'm gonna let Richard Dawkins help me, okay?
okay? We don't quote Richard Dawkins very often in church. He is the noted atheistic geneticist, uh, one of the top in the world. And here's what he says. I wanna, I'll, just, I'll just quote him in full. The total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation. In a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, in other words, if that's all this is, we're nothing but cause and effect over billions of years, and what humans are is genetic reproducing machines. That's it. We're just smart monkeys. We're evolved primates reproducing to keep our species alive. If that's it, he continues, in that world, some people are gonna get hurt and other people are gonna get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, hear it, nor any justice or any injustice. He continues, the universe that we observe is precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Life is empty, pointless, futile, a desert of meaninglessness, a desert, not a desert, that'd be two S's, a desert, either way it works, I think it works in the quote either way, don't you think? Let's go with desert. A desert of meaninglessness and insignificance. Now, if, if you're here and you've adopted this worldview, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, well, welcome, welcome. And if you've got questions and doubt, I still got questions and doubt. We'd love to process that with you. But let me ask you to take your worldview to the foundation. Live it out consistently this is the worldview you've adopted, then when you see pain in your life and you experience it, or you see injustice out in our world and we experience that, and you go clamoring for a meaning and a purpose in that, don't, there is none. You are an evolved primate, and all the other humans you know are evolved primates. At some point, all of us will be in the ground. Eventually, this, the star that we revolve around will begin to lose energy that will grow and become a red giant and absorb this planet up and burn everything up. There's no rhyme, no reason, no purpose, no justice, no right, no wrong to any of it. So don't go looking for it. Now, I don't find many people that live that worldview out consistently. In fact, Dawkins struggles to do it himself. But let me challenge you to apply the same skepticism to your worldview that you're applying to Christianity. Just challenge you there. If you wanna talk more, I would personally love. We'll go get coffee, we'll go get lunch. Let me show you though the difference of what we're gonna see in Hebrews. So go to Hebrews chapter two, everybody. We're gonna first see that Jesus, this conception of God that we have in the scripture is radically different. There's nothing like this claim. The first thing we're gonna see is he meets us in it. Look at verse nine. We see Jesus because he suffered death crowned. He tasted death for everyone. Verse 10, he was made perfect through what he suffered. Verse 11, he's part of the same family that we are. Verse 14, he shares in our humanity. Verse 17, he was made like us in every way. A radical conception of God is what we're seeing in Hebrews chapter 2, that he comes and he meets us in the pain. He's not aloof. He's not a million miles away, but he has come and incarnated himself in this world, in the hurt and the pain of this world. He's gotten his feet dirty. He knows what it's like to be rejected. He weeps at the, at the tomb of his friend. He's walked with people through illness. He's seen people weep as they've had to carry somebody along in life who's struggling. He's hungered, he's thirsted. He knows what it's like to feel rejection and pain. It's a radical conception of God. If you haven't processed this in a while, this is one of the things that the writer of the Hebrews is trying to help them see because it will give them the poise they need. He meets us in it, but it's not enough. It's not just enough for him to meet us in the pain. We're gonna see he also leads us through. Look at verse 10, 2.10. He says, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting for God. This is God's plan, God's design. It was fitting for God to make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. 
Now, I, I really, really nerded out this week. Um, look at your Bibles. Look down, whatever you've got. And, and look at the translation of this word pioneer. Some of your Bibles will say author. Uh, some will say a beginner or something like that. Some will say pioneer. Is, is this right? Do I have something like one of those three things? Looking down. Look down. Not at me. You can see. Okay. Uh, now I really nerded out this week. I probably spent too much time on it. I went and looked at how this word, this Greek word, the Greek word is archegos. Say it on three with me. Archegos. One, two, three. Hey, there we go. Greek speakers. Look at you. Um, so, archegos. This word archegos. Um, I looked at its usage in the New Testament, only a handful of times, a little bit more in the Greek Old Testament, and then I really nerded out and looked at how it was used in, in all ancient Greek literature and started looking at the word and how it was used. And uh, somebody joked and said, you should just use the commentary. I'm like, well, yeah, that's probably faster. But uh, I, got, I got in the weeds on this thing. The word archegos, it has the idea of a representative of a group of people who faces down a, a dangerous situation for them. Here's a good example. Uh, do you remember in Numbers chapter 13, which most of you don't, so I'll tell you. Uh, in Numbers 13, the, uh, the nation of Israel is going to spy out the land. And they select 12 archegoses from the tribes of Israel. They are representatives who will go on behalf of the people into the land. The best word picture for this, I think, is we, not just the word but the picture, is David and Goliath. Here's the, the translation I think I like the best. He makes the champion. Archegos means he's the champion. He's the one who will stare down the enemy on behalf of the people. Remember David and Goliath? The two armies sit face to face, eye to eye, and the Philistines selected a champion. Instead of fighting the whole army versus each other, we'll select a champion, an Archegos, and this champion will square off against the other champion, and the Israelites are terrified because nobody can beat the champion of the Philistines. And David goes forward. That's, what, that's the concept of the champion. On behalf of the people, they stare down the enemy. And the author of the Hebrews is saying, Jesus, it was fitting for God that Jesus would be our archegos. Now, Jesus didn't just go after the, like the easy enemy, kind of the low-hanging fruit, the easy target. No, Jesus went after the ultimate enemy, the great champion that is against us. You remember in video games, back when you used to play video games, or if you still play video games, uh, if you remember, there's always in games that had like a journey in them and had different levels. There were usually at the end of those levels, there were like a boss you had to defeat. Do you remember this? And then there was a boss for each level. And then you get to the end of the game and there'd be like the ultimate villain, the ultimate boss that you had to try to defeat. And that was usually the most difficult one to beat because they were the strongest and the most powerful. And then if you beat that boss, you won the game. Maybe the best example for little kids is this guy. Like Bowser is kind of the ultimate boss at the end of the Mario game. What we're gonna see with Jesus, he didn't go after level one kind of easy, easy villains. He went after the great enemy. And what we're gonna see is that enemy is actually more comp complex than we think. He's gonna go in outnumbered against two, our two great enemies. He's gonna square off as our champion on our behalf. Look at verse 14, let's take a look at this. What are these two great enemies? The first is death. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The first great enemy that our champion faces off against is death and the fear of death. Here's the story the Bible is telling. All the way back in Genesis one and two, God created humanity to enjoy his presence and receive from him the provision of life. That's what the tree of life represents. If you receive from me, then you'll receive life. Trust me, obey me, walk with me, and you'll be crowned, and I'll bring life to you. But instead, there's this whisper in Genesis chapter and this whisper in the ear of humanity, we're, we're told there it's a snake. Revelation 12 will tell us there's a, there's a 
being a force that is at work, and it begins to whisper in the ear of humanity. And the whisper goes like this, don't receive power, take power. Don't receive wisdom, take wisdom. And humanity said, we can crown ourselves. We can build a kingdom of our own making where we are at the center. And by the way, that's resulted in all of the brokenness and pain and selfishness and greed that we see in this world. The justice and injustice, the Bible's gonna gonna walk right into what we see in our world and give us its origin in the story. And as a result, we no longer receive life, but we're chasing that whisper and it's leading to death. And we've been enslaved to that power all the way back to Genesis 3. Death and the fear of death because of our failure and our desire, our failure to listen to God and our desire to make a kingdom of our own, death. What is it about the fear of death that is so terrifying, so dreadful? It's morbid, I know. You ever thought about it? Like, what is it about the fear of death? Yes, there's the pain involved. And yes, there's the, the missing out on maybe something that we thought we were gonna experience or somebody that we loved was gonna experience, or the, the, the missing of loved ones. I know, I know it's also the uncertainty of what's beyond there. Death is that dark land from which no one has returned. When Shakespeare said, the conscience, our awareness of death makes cowards of us all. I think death also exposes in us what we really have made life to be all about anyway. You ever met somebody who's gone through an illness or been near death in some kind of experience, they almost always come back with, I've got this new insight in life. I've got this amazing, this amazing things I've learned about life because death exposes what life is really about. This is Tolstoy, I think, uh, helping us kind of understand why this fear of death is so prevalent in our world, in your life and my life. We all are enslaved to it. This is Tolstoy wrestling with it, the Russian writer. The question which brought me to the verge of suicide, he says, sought an answer without which one cannot live. Is there any meaning in life that my inevitable death does not destroy? Today or tomorrow, death will come to those I love and then to me. Soon not only I will not exist, but eventually no one will exist to remember anything I've written or done. Why then go on with the effort? What is it all for? What does it all lead to? For a time it was possible to live intoxicated with life, but as soon as one is sober, it is impossible not to see that life in the face of death is a fraud and a stupid that dark land from which no one returns, the great unknown, the one that is this place that has enslaved every single one of us. It's the fear of death. It's our great enemy. And no one comes back from that land. Unless, unless, we have to understand the radical claim that we're making as Christians. If you're a Jesus follower in the room, what we believe is strange, yet profound. What we are saying is one has come back from death. This is where Christmas and Good Friday and Easter all smash together, Christmas. He shares in our flesh and blood. He's become incarnate, that means in flesh, so that by his death on Good Friday, death takes its best swing on him. As our champion, he goes and he stares down death and he enables it, he allows it to take its best swing on him on the cross. But on Easter, y'all realize that what we claim, what we believe about Easter means everything is different, right? What we believe is that on Easter, that tomb really is empty. It's not a myth, it's in the story. We believe that one has come back from death. Amen? And if we believe that one has come back from death, do you see why this is giving them poison to pain? If that is true, then everything is different. Everything is different. The great enemy called death has been defeated. And he's saying, you have to root deep in what you believe. But our second enemy, our second enemy is sin. Death and sin. He's gonna say we need a 
high priest. So what does a priest do? We're gonna talk a lot more about the priesthood over these next few weeks, so I'll be brief here. What does a priest do? A priest in the ancient Near Eastern world, the priest represents the people before their deity. The people are messed up, they're filthy, they're unclean, they need to be cleansed so that they can approach the deity and the deity can then meet them and bless them. That's the concept of a priest. So the priest, on behalf of the people, approaches the deity and usually with a sacrifice, enables the people now to be able to experience the blessing of the deity. You with me? That's the exact same concept in the Hebrew Old Testament and it's exactly what we're gonna see here. We need a priest because of our uncleanness because of our self-centeredness, because of the wounds that have been done to you and the wounds that you've inflicted on other people, because of the selfishness, because of our idolatry, because of our sexual brokenness, because of the hurt and the injustice that we see in our world, we call all of that sin. And we need to be cleansed. We need to be made whole. We need a priest who can do that. And what we're gonna see is Jesus is both the, our great high priest and the sacrifice. Look at verse 17. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. He is our archegos. He's our champion. He stared down death and defeated it and He's our great high priest, and he's the sacrifice that goes and makes cleansing for you and for me so we can have access straight to the Father. He's our champion. He meets us in our pain, he leads us through our pain, and he calls us beyond our pain. What do, what do I mean by that? What does he see through to the other side with? Look at verse 10 again. Glory. Circle it. Glory. He sees through the pain. And what does he see? Glory. Not only does Jesus meet us in it and defeat our enemies, but he leads us through to the other side. And what's there? Glory. This is amazing truth for you and for me in the midst of our pain. Glory. This is why he quotes from Psalm 22 and Isaiah 8. You're gonna see this in the, in, as we go through Hebrews. The author is gonna pick these Old Testament passages and sometimes it's gonna be a little strange. And you're gonna have to work to figure out why did he go here with this passage? Psalm 22. What is Psalm 22? He quotes it right here and says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. What? What's that all about? Psalm 22 is a royal song about a royal figure who will suffer. And he will suffer in great, great trial and pain. It begins this way. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it details the pain that this royal figure will go through. But it doesn't stop there. The psalm finishes with a triumphant declaration. My God will deliver me. I will see through to the other side. And on the other side, I will sing and declare it to my brothers and sisters. See why he's quoting this? Isaiah 8 is what he quotes in these next two. It's a similar idea. He's calling us through to glory. I think Paul has the same idea in Romans 8. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Jesus is our champion, meets us in it. He leads us through it, and he calls us to glory. This is what unlocks poise for mile 18 in life. This church 2,000 years ago needed it, you and I need it. How do we get it? What's the secret? We're gonna see over and over and over and over again in Hebrews. See Jesus. See Jesus. Just behold him. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. See Jesus, our strength, our poise comes from him. 
not from pulling yourselves up by your bootstraps, not from your own emotional fortitude, not from learning more about yourself and your Enneagram number, not from your own financial security, not from your 401k, not from a politician, not from a party. It comes from seeing him. That's where we get poised in our pain. He is our champion. There's nothing else in any religious system, in any spiritual ideology that sounds anything like this. Here's how we close. This is Titus um, from a few years ago. Uh, it's my favorite picture of him. It's about the age he was when his story happened, and this is very true, this picture. Um, we're going to the beach after the second service. We're going to get in the car and drive down there today, uh, and this story took place there. So if you think about the beach, uh, we were sitting there, and uh, Titus was, this was a few years ago, he was, he was too young to be able to really navigate being out in the surf without his floaties on and, and probably an adult. Um, and if you've been to the beach with kids, this tends to happen. You know, you've been out there playing with them, and you know, they're, they're kind of doing stuff in the sand, and you tell them, don't go out past the surf. Don't go out there without an adult. And then they're playing, so you, you, you grab a seat, and you've got, you know, you're dried off, and you've got the salt all off, and you've got your book, and you've got your beverage, and you're sitting there. And I look up, and Titus is out in the surf, past where it shouldn't be. And he's out there, and I can tell he's getting frightened because there's an undertow, and the, the waves are hitting him. Now, as a parent, I've got some options right there, don't I? And I, I, am, I am comfortable, right? I could look over at Sarah. I told him not to go out there. I mean, he's got to learn at some point. This is a good time to let him learn. I could even walk over to the, to the edge of the water and go, Titus, I told you not to do that. He's kicking and screaming, gasping. I told you. See? I could even emotionally, my heart could go out towards him. Oh, man, this stinks for him. I hope he can get out of that. Now, the reality is none of those would make me a loving parent. And you're, you all get it, right? For me, as a loving parent, to, he's out there kicking and screaming. The undertow's pulling him. I have to get wet. Like, I've got to get in the water, right? What Hebrews 2 is telling us is Jesus, he got all the way in, and the waves crash in on him as he comes out and meets us and leads us out. There's nothing like it. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to take communion. And if you should have your communion uh, as you came in, if you don't, we have some in the back. You can stand up and grab it. I'm going to invite you just to grab yours. I'll give you a moment to... Uh, Open it. Um, but I want us to reflect on this. This is our hope. This is our confidence. This is our poise. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, as often as you eat of this bread, remember me, my body that was broken for you. Because he met us in it and he faced down our enemy. We have confidence in him. As often as we eat of it, we remember him. So church, let's take, let's eat. And on that same night, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. He's our faithful and merciful high priest who makes atonement for the sins of the people. And as often as you drink of it, remember me. So church, we remember him. Because of what he's done for us as our champion, we can sing confidently. So would you stand and sing with us?